Welcome to the August episode of International Voices. My name is Udo Fluck. I oversee the Office of Global and Cultural Affairs in Arts Missoula, and I am the host and moderator of this podcast series. To listen to episodes from earlier this year or last year, please visit artsmissoula.org. Click on Global and Cultural Affairs and visit radio and podcasts. International Voices is a monthly podcast brought to you through a collaboration of Global and Cultural Affairs in Arts Missoula and the Trail 1033. We are starting a new three-part series with a focus on cultures and the environment this month. And we're kicking it off with tea in the 21st century, environmental sustainability and social responsibility. The benefits of tea include reducing the impact of stress, protecting us from chronic disease, and its ability to strengthen the immune system, to name just a few of the many advantages. For many people, life without tea is unthinkable, and billions of people rely on their cup of tea to get them through the day. And while the demand for tea has never been higher due to growing popularity and population, the topic of tea in the 21st century is closely connected to such topics as environmental sustainability and social responsibility. My guest today has a wealth of knowledge on the topic, not only as a tea merchant, but also as an environmental activist. I would like to welcome Jake Krylik, owner of Lake Missoula Tea Company, to the August episode of International Voices. Jake, thank you for being here. Can you tell us how you got into the tea business? Sure, Udo. Uh, good to be here. And our journey with Lake Missoula Tea Company started in 2012. Um, so we're approaching our nine-year anniversary mm -hmm. uh, this fall. It's been an incredibly rewarding experience, but also humbling for us. And really the origins um, to the tea world um, came through my friend Tobin Ropes, who I met through rugby. Um, Tobin opened the Mad Hat Tea Company in Tacoma, Washington in 2006. And when our daughter Tashina started going to school at the University of Puget Sound, we kind of rekindled our friendship. And Tobin has served as both our mentor and our model um, and really helped us launch our business and navigate through a lot of different layers of the tea industry. Neither Heather nor I had any knowledge or direct experience with tea, and so Tobin's advice was huge for us. The two things he emphasized um, that have kept with us, um, and so were really important in terms of our formation and development, number one, Focus on loose leaf teas. By their very nature, loose leaf tea comes from smaller producers who are growing and processing fresher, more flavorful tea. Um, so in that sense, they're concerned not so much about the volume of tea produced, but the right. quality. Right. And so we'll, I'll get into this in a little bit more, but sure. you know, think about premium teas, premium grade teas versus the CTC style, we could say cut toward curl. It's more, it looks more like coffee. Right. And those are what you see in your breakfast bags, right. know, those black breakfast bag teas, right. is the CTC style. Um, the second part um, that really Tobin helped us with was designing our space as more than just a shop and incorporating the bar concept. So this is a social association that attracted younger people, right. men, and others who may be curious about tea. So if you've been downtown to our tea bar you know that it has a different feel. There's a um, conversation piece that, that is yes. happening there, and it's not just about purchasing and leaving the store, but it's about being there and consuming it, and while you do, have a conversation with somebody else, perhaps. Exactly. Right. It's right. very much a warm, welcoming atmosphere. Right. Can you tell us about tea growing today and how it is different from the tea growing of the past, what has changed over the years? Well, a lot has changed. Um, our perspective is certainly, um, it's reflected in, in our travels um, to many of the, the farms that we visited 
and I'm speaking of these small, you know, kind of artisan um, oriented producers. Uh, one needs to remember that for at least the last 5,000 years, the beverage called tea has been made from the leaves of Camellia sinensis. Camellia is a member of the evergreen family. And uh, it's Chinese origins, of course. Um, sinensis means from China. So right. Camellia sinensis is evergreen from China. Right. Um, are rooted, though, in small producers who develop distinctive cultivars um, and that, you know, really stemming from its wild early days where it evolved in this very lush, rich, tropical forest right. in Southeast Asia. Um, now look at it and it's on all six or all it's on six continents minus Antarctica. Right. Um, but it's now obviously grown in many different kinds of growing sites from the humid tropics where, again, it evolved from all the way now to temperate zones, you know, which... Huh do get cold and right, right. will experience some snow. So it's a right. pretty hardy plant for sure. Um, the other thing, of course, to keep in mind is that the best tea always grows at elevation. It means it grows in the mountains. Right. Yeah, and that's, again, because of some of the processes that happen once you have water, evapotranspiration, right. hitting the leaves. Oftentimes, of course, it might be coming off the ocean. Sure. Uh, but in any mountain environment you've got that uplift going on right and so it's changing the chemistry of the leaf and really enhancing the flavors i see okay yes now during our visits we had a few opportunities to visit some large tea plantations and factories in indonesia and kenya on those trips and they certainly represent the legacy of the colonial tea estates that emerged in the 1800s when the british and other european countries started importing tea uh, tea quickly became a very valuable international commodity um, as consumer demand grew, and consequently, tea was planted throughout the Commonwealth. So, obviously, India, um, right. Ceylon, now referred to as Sri Lanka, um, and starting in the early 1900s after the British um, moved some families, you got some expats that moved to Kenya, they started growing tea in the early 1900s there. Um, certainly, the Dutch also planted it throughout Java um, in Indonesia. Um, the French planted it in Vietnam. Um, so many of the colonial powers got involved in tea production. Okay. Now, the colonial model relied on conversion of native forests to monocultures. This resulted in widespread deforestation and habitat loss, um, lots of water diversions and impoundments uh, because tea does need good amount of water. Right. And with the onset of industrial fertilizers and pesticides, this didn't happen until probably after the Second World War. Right. Um, widespread applications of chemicals. Hmm. Um, though these tea estates are now largely in private ownership, their origins and structure were tied to colonial governments who often relied on slave labor. Uh, tea picking and production is very labor intensively. And so, you know, we have to frame that versus now which is much more of a mechanical, uh, much more of an industrial scale. Right. Um, and Kenyan is a really good example of the transition that has occurred in the tea industry. Um, the Kenyan Tea Development Agency, which was set up by the Kenyan government to promote smallholder tea farming after independence in the early 1960s, became a private organization in 2000. Now the KTDA manages 67 factories in Kenya processing mostly the black CTC style teas, the bag breakfast tea, as well though as increasing supplies of the whole leaf black and green tea. That's what we're interested in at Lake Missoula Tea Company. About 60% of the tea processed in Kenya now comes from small tea producers, which is a testament to the government's commitment to helping small tea farmers. Kenya is now the third largest exporter of tea in the world. Oh, wow. So it shows you that if the government commits to it, right. they really, really can decentralize it and make it much more, I think, a benefit to the whole country. Right. And I believe that um, you know, these, these figures may be slightly out of date because we were there in 2016, but I think about 4% of Kenyan's GDP comes from tea. So it's a good chunk. Sure. Um, so with the end of the colonial era and the gradual shift – uh, away from the large central t uh, centralized tea estates, the biggest change to the makeup uh, of the tea industry has come from consumers who are now seeking higher quality tea that's grown in more natural environments by local people, you right. know, local tea farmers and, and local tea workers. 
And then, of course, that processing is much more of a hand rolled or a, a hand um, crafted operation. Right. Um, large tea plantations still exist and still contribute heavily to the overall share of tea production, but the market for loose leaf tea continues to gain market share. And so that's again where a company like ours comes in. This is really interesting. I had no idea that uh, the quality of tea is dependent on elevation of where it grows. Mm -hmm. And that the higher it, it is where it grows, the higher the quality of it is. So you need to have a certain balance of elevation, sun, water, or... And this is particularly relevant now in the era of climate change. Right. Because what some of the researchers are saying is that climate change is already affecting not only the yields, right. you know, the amount of tea grown, right. but it's also affecting the flavor. Right. I, I know um, that tea is actually a very delicate plant. And so it's it, it doesn't like large variations in temperature and it doesn't and as you said, it, it, it needs a good amount of water. And so when any of this changes, uh, there is a problem and yeah. it's not it's not growing the way it should. So I think that's. But but the fact that um, the elevation piece mm -hmm. is so important, I, I did not know that. So that's pretty interesting. Um, you typically work with smaller farms, you mm -hmm. just said, and uh, because this newer model is more diversity in the tea growing and smaller farms can can produce that. It's not just all one big company that does one thing, but there's lots of, of, of smaller tea operations that grow very specific tea. Um, how is that different than working with the larger farms, working with smaller farms? And you talked a little bit about it in, in your response. Yep. Before, but perhaps you get can, into more detail. Yeah, you on could that. go into. So the reason that we work with small tea farms is because they produce higher quality loose leaf teas, and we also believe, of course, that they're more sustainable for the environment, right? And produce far greater social and economic benefits to the surrounding communities. So it's it's two tiered. Obviously, we think it's better product, right? But secondly, we think it's better for the environment and for the people who are you know, basically responsible for growing and producing it. Right. Many of the teas we import are hand-rolled or, as I said, hand-processed. This is certainly the case with our mammoth red from Indonesia and many of our Chinese and Taiwanese oolongs. Um, and they all rely on a local workforce, mostly people living in villages right next to the tea farms. So really close, you know, in terms of that relationship. Um, and while there is machinery involved with the processing, you know, a lot of this is, you know, somewhat antiquated Chinese machinery. Um, it is nowhere near as, as, as industrialized as the process for making the CTC style teas, which would be more equivalent to like um, a modern factory. Right. You know, with, you know, kind of an assembly line. Sure. You know, kind of feel to it. Sure. Um, and so the, the artists and tea farms and producers, um, they've really allowed us to develop relationships with them. I think on the larger company scale, um, it's often hard for you as a, a wholesale customer of them to really develop those ties. With all the farms and all the companies we visited, we now have not only a relationship, but friendships. Um, so right. that's been incredibly valuable for us, um, those relationships. And they, like us, are concerned with the tea's quality and freshness and also with not degrading or polluting the environment. Many of the tea farms um, who we work with are using organic practices or are actually certified USDA or EU. They've gone through that process, which is not cheap. Um, we are more concerned about what's happening on the ground than what's on the label. So that's us at Lake Missoula Tea Company. Um, as I said, we are getting to the point where we may be able to certify ourselves as organic but that involves our blending and our warehouse. Sure. You know, it has nothing to do with where the tea comes from. Right. You have to have a certified um, operation, you know, right. to be organic and to have that label. Um, like I said, it's a process. Um, so um, just so you know, it takes about two years for a tea plant to build up the immunity needed to fight bugs 
without the pesticides and to be able to produce on a regular basis. Now, you know, normally there's at least three pickings or what we say flushes for each tea plant every year. You've got the spring flush, you've got the summer flush, and you usually get a fall flush. All of those teas are different in terms of its flavor. And so once you become like sort of a tea connoisseur or right. you get to the point where you're tasting a lot, you can notice those differences really? in the flavor based on the seasonality. Yes, huh. you can. And again, it's only through artisan tea farms that you're really going to get to that depth right. of understanding. Now. Our business philosophy is to work with the small producers who know how to respect the local ecology. So in other words, it's more about blending the tea into its native environment right? Um, rather than obviously carving out this huge footprint. Right. The old style was we're going to cut down as many trees as we can because most of this was forested habitat. Before, and turn it into a tea plantation. And turn it into a tea plantation. Right. Now it's much more about agroforestry because you've got shaded trees that are helping to keep the tea plants cool. Right. More about permaculture, you know, mm -hmm. where you're planting different things mm -hmm. into the tea, right. um, which obviously benefits the local flora and the local fauna. Um, now, here's a good example. Um, our Indonesian tea farm plants biocontrol plants. So this is kind of practicing what we refer to as integrated pest management, like lemongrass, ginger, and pandang. Um, and these are planted to help ward off the bugs, mm -hmm. you know, to help keep the pests away. Um, they use bat guano and cow dung for fertilizer. Um, and so, you know, those are really, really good examples of how they're trying not to, again, pollute or degrade the environment. Right. Now, of course, where our farm in uh, Indonesia is located is right next to Mount Halaman Salak National Park. Um, and so on our second trip, one of the village chiefs took us down to the waterfall. And so this whole area, the, the Herondong started in 2006, I believe. Um, so it's about 15 years old right now. When it started, there was virtually nothing there. Now, because of the tea farm and the infrastructure that the tea farm has built and the factory, you've got tourists that are coming to see the park for sure. And to see some of those villages, which are, you know, fairly remote and, and pretty authentic, um, but also to check the tea out. Right. That the tea itself has kind of become a tourist attraction, which we, of course, Heather and I felt very, very cool about. Um, but so they built a little tea house, you know, where you can come in and have a cup of tea. Sure. Um, but it just showed to us because we were there. Our first trip was to Indonesia in 2014. We went back after we went to India and the second trip was far more illuminating, one, because the plants were that much more mature, mm -hmm. but the whole place had a different feel to it. Um, and again, so that's sort of the evolution of a farm that, you know, most of the tea that they're producing is not being sold in Indonesia. They're right. producing it for export markets in the U.S., Canada, Germany, um, right. Right. Japan. Right. You know, so kind of higher end markets. They do process or they do make some tea for local um, markets. Sure. But again, it's not the premium teas. Right. You know, it's not the premium loose leaf teas. Um, so the other thing I was going to mention, of course, is that, you know, we have a little connection with our in Indonesian uh, cohorts. In that last March, we had the council general from the San Francisco um, consulate office come here with a couple of staff and he was meeting with the governor over in Helen, but he stayed in here in Missoula and obviously met with Udo and I and others at Arts Missoula because they're so into it because we're selling Indonesian tea. And I participated um, the summer before last on a, a webinar featuring Indonesian products. They're sold in the U.S. So, again, we've made some really good connections with our Indonesian counterparts. Right. Um, so, again, I feel really lucky that we have that connection. And, and the whole thing to me is so interesting, and, and perhaps some listeners might, might uh, appreciate this, that when, for the longest time when I thought of tea, mm -hmm. I thought of something that was hanging at the end of a string in a tiny bag, <laughs> and it was dry, it was dry. And therefore, the fact that you said um, it's, uh, with tea, it's a lot about freshness, um, tea uh, likes to be with other tea. I, I, That's what we say, right? But but I always thought that it's a it's a dried product that needs to be 
immersed in water. But even so, once you put it in that bag, it automatically is going to start drying out. Right. And becoming, you know, not not undrinkable. Right. But it becomes more stale. You know, it's just... Again, but what I'm hearing here, special. Jake, is that there's a world of <sighs> difference between what I grew up with and probably a lot of people out there uh, to what is a an artisan tea or a connoisseur tea. It's that, not unlike what's happening or what's already happened with the coffee industry where you right. see all of the roasters. And again, single origin, you know, that's part of what we're doing. But right. it really, that coffee resolution that started in the 1990s. Right. Um, and so that focus around different ways of roasting the bean. Right. You know, and getting, extracting different flavor profiles right. from the bean. This has been going on in the tea world for centuries, but it just hadn't really been introduced to our country. Right. You know, in the same way. Now, I will say that, you know, um, back during the uh, American Revolution and the Boston Tea Party and all that, you know, that wasn't bag tea back then. Right. That was That was loose black tea that was coming from China. So, and even, I think you talk to some of your ancestor or, you know, your, your grandparents and, and, you know, and relatives, they can remember getting loose tea back in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. Before it came in before bags. Before it became, you know, really in vogue to have right. it in the bag. Now, right. we Americans invented the tea bag, came out of the World Fair in St. Louis. Yeah, it was one of the, the new innovations. Um, so, again, it obviously has application and sure. you know, many to-go accounts. You know, they still want to use tea bags. Um, but what we like to tell people is once you start drinking loose leaf tea, you will not go back because, as like I said, it's not it's just the freshness. It's a different it's world. It's the flavors that you're going to be really tapping into. And this reminds me, Jake, of uh, my years uh, at the university when I was a student and I was pretty active in um, the International Student Association and I remember distinctly, and this is many years ago, that there was a student from Japan who offered to do a tea ceremony mm -hmm. uh, as, as, a, uh, as a cultural experience or as a cultural uh, exercise. And I and I thought, and I'm sure many others, well, what is the ceremony? You add hot water to it and the thing is done, right? That's what you would think. When we observed what she did and how meticulous mm -hmm. she was about, it wasn't so much making the tea, it was almost like celebrating the tea or honoring yes. the tea. Yes. And it, it left such an imprint on me because, again, coming from a background of coffee drinkers, tea was not a very common thing. And if we did have tea, it was not loose leaf. So for her to do this entire ceremony that was so uh, artfully crafted in all its pieces. And I would say that it's, it's, it's an exercise in mind, body, and spirit. And that's yeah, exactly what she said. It's not so much about drinking the tea and quenching your thirst, if that's why you drink it, yeah. but it's about a whole body experience that connects. And so what you just said, the, the mind, the, the soul, it's, it's all of that that tea somehow can bring together. And that I just remember that tea ceremony so vividly yeah. because it was one of those moments where you kind of said to yourself, oh boy, I've done it wrong for all these years. <laughs> uh, you know, who knew? Well, we, we, knew? All, we all know how structured the Japanese are. And, right, you know, I mean, right. You, you just love them because they are, you know, when I was there in 2019, the best host in the world, and I, I would go back in a heartbeat. I, I, I just can't say enough good things about them. Um, but it is. It's very deliberate. It's, it's, it's very ritualistic. Right. But, you have to understand, tea is so ingrained in right. other cultures that it may not be the way the Japanese are doing it. But if you're in a Turkish tea house and all of a sudden you're around, you know. It's just as ceremonial. It's, it's just as ceremonial. It's right. just taking a different form. Right. It's still right. social, though. Right, you right, know? right. And again, like I said, there's countless um, cultures that have brought tea in 
and have held on to it because right. obviously it's good for you, but also it has a property of, like I said, bringing people together and sparking conversation. It's a community aspect it's to it. It's a community element to it for right. sure. Now, uh, back to the coffee thing, I just wanted to mention that we have many um, coffee drinkers who come into the tea shop and um, you know they're either wanting to reduce the amount of coffee they drink or get off of it entirely. And uh, myself, I love the flavor of coffee, and I still drink the occasional cup, latte. But for me, it's just very acidic um, for my stomach. So that's one element of it that for some people, it's a little hard on their, on their digestion. Now, the other part of it is the caffeine release. And so tea has an amino acid called L-thionine. And L-thionine is basically the regulator. It's what keeps you um, calm. Um, it kind of uh, reduces anxiety. Um, but you never get those really strong peaks or those really song, you know, kind of metabolic surges, which you get with really strong espressos and whatnot. Right. Um, so, again, it's just a much more even, gradual release. And so, again, I think a lot of people really enjoy that about tea, that, again, it just keeps you alert and calm and focused, um, but without the peaks and the valleys. So what I'm hearing here, Jake, is that there's hope for me too. There is hope for you, Udo, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but again, like I said, I'm not criticizing coffee in any way, shape, sure. or form. And sure. we work with many different coffee companies because they sell tea as well. Sure. And so, no, not to downgrade it at all, but it's just, again, how it affects you and right. your metabolism. right. And I think it's always about the more you know, right? I mean, if, if you don't know much about something, you're probably not likely to uh, to dive into it. But but the more you know, the more you might realize that this might actually be your cup of tea. <laughs> now, well said. <laughs> now you you mentioned uh, earlier mm -hmm. uh climate change and the, the effect and impact of climate change on, uh, on tea growing. Um, climate change is affecting agriculture in many ways. Can you speak a little bit more to how some of the farms you work with are specifically impacted by climate change? Yes, and indeed climate change is starting to adversely affect uh, many traditional tea growing areas. Um, as the climate becomes more unpredictable and uh, volatile, um, tea farms are having to adapt to higher temperatures, uh, less rainfall, uh, longer drought periods, uh, more powerful storms, and increasing impacts from insects and disease. The result of all that is smaller yields. So that's the big fear, is that we're just not going to be producing the same amount of tea. Um, but... You know, I think in a real tangible of, uh, uh, way, climate change is affecting the growing seasons, which then is affecting the flavors and then affecting the health benefits. So there are somewhere on the order of um, 150 different chemicals in tea, and many of these haven't really been properly researched yet. But what they do know, you know, in terms of the antioxidants, um, the polyphenols and the catechins, is that these are incredibly important um, to your body to help ward off those things that break down cell structure. So kind of to ward off those free radicals floating around in your body. Right. Tea has those antioxidants, which, again, provide a natural defense. Um, so, again, climate change means that we may lose not only flavor, but we may lose some of those health benefits. Now, um, hotter temps and heat waves, of course, we just experienced that here on the West Coast, and yeah. experienced it today here in Missoula for sure, Right, um, are harmful to tea plants and to tea workers. So let's not forget the human side of it. Right. Um, these droughts spurred the Kenyan tea, tea Research Institute to experiment with bioengineering, a hybrid tea that is now commonly referred to as purple tea. They crossed the tea plant with some local rainforest trees and plants to produce a hardier tea plant that is much more resistant to droughts, frost, disease, and insects. Um, purple tea has a purple color and is full of antioxidants and anthocyanins, which are anti-carcinogenics. So the anthocyanins are the natural pigments mm -hmm. in any blue or purple plant. Mm -hmm. And so, again, those are very helpful for your metabolism as right. well. Um, 
The flavor of purple tea is drier, so we think it resembles more of a green tea. That's why we have it in kind of in the green tea section in the okay. shop. And is often referred to as a super tea because of its health benefits and its climate adaptive qualities. Now, our observations when we went to Kenya, I think, are most applicable here because we all know of all the droughts that East Africa has experienced over the last 40-odd years. And when we visited uh, in the fall of 2016 uh, to see the tea farm in the Western Highlands, um, that's where we were getting our purple tea from. We had gotten from um, uh, another source in Kenya, um, which went away. And so um, our farmer, David, reached out to us. Now, here's a real sad story. Um, just in May, um, we found out that our farmer, David Bohr, died of COVID. Yeah, May 19th, uh, 40 years old. Um, so it just, again, shows you some of the um, inequities, I guess, um, between, you know, the, the richest countries and the poorest countries. Um, but in any event, it's kind of thrown us for a loop, and we're not sure what's going to happen. Obviously, um, we've reached out to his wife, Bernadine, and their two daughters, and Again, we're, we're wondering if they're going to be able to continue. Um, but suffice to say, it's a really, really bad situation um, for them and, and for us uh, because we've built up a pretty good following right. um, for right. the Purple Tea. Um, so that one, um, you know, David planted 15 hectares of the Purple Tea in 2014. And this is something that's been pretty widespread within the tea industry in Kenya is to get farmers to plant the Purple Tea instead of the regular Camellia sinensis plants. Right. Um, just because of their resistance. Um, and so that's something that obviously we want to continue to support. And also, of course, as David's plants got older, the flavor got better, you know, as those, those plants right. matured. Um, now, other strategies to help offset impacts from climate change would include the agroforestry side, right. you know, planting more shade trees, and again, trying to keep it cool sure. underneath. And then, of course implementing more permaculture design um, where you can, again, focus on some of the biological diversity. Um, you know, I guess uh, the other place that I would um, uh, point to is our farm down in Colombia, um, where they're doing a lot of stuff in the Western Andes to try and combat climate change. Um, they are uh, doing a lot of reforestation, um, trying to bring some of the rainforest back. Um, now that they're not uh, basically... Um, planting tea plants for that CTC style production. Now they're buying all that tea from India and they're putting in bags. That's for their South American market. Okay. But Pataco is now growing premium tea plants for loose leaf tea production. Right. So they've changed their business model right. in some ways to focus on these new markets. Right. But also, I think, to adapt to some of these environmental um, and climate issues. Um, so to us, that's another good example of like a farm that is looking down the road here. Um, they're also doing a bunch of really good watershed restoration in the Bataco River, um, which is really important as their catchment, sure. you know, as their, right. as their primary drainage. Um, so, again, you've got to make sure you're safeguarding your water supplies um, as well as leaving enough forest to make sure that the plants just don't burn up. Right. Well, I'm very sorry to hear about um, your business partner, David, and who, now I understand this better, small farms, was probably much more than a business partner and was actually a friend of yours. Oh, and very much so. And I mean, the, the hospitality he showed when he brought Heather and I into our house, we slept in their bedroom. Mm -hmm. the, I'm serious. You know, that was it. You know, you're in, boom. Totally rolled out the red carpet. Um, the night before we left, Udo killed a goat. Uh -huh. So that's like very right. high up yep. honor to yep. have a goat. Yep. You know, and um, you know, just c countless things that he has been able to do for Heather over the years. And um, of course, you know, we had recently experienced some supply side issues right. because of the sure. backup at all the ports. Right. And so we were waiting on this purple tea shipment for probably three months or something. It was at least three months delayed. Um, and then we got it in March. Right. You know, and of course, David reached out at that point when we got it. But um, no, it's a, it, it's a really hard one for us because obviously we haven't had to experience this before. Right. You know, right. where you lose a trusted, you know, business associate and, and, and right. a, yes, a friend too. Right. Well, and it, I had one of my questions for you I had in mind was to ask you about 
how has the pandemic impacted mm. the tea market and how has COVID impacted, uh, you know, everything, mm. um, not only the the tea farmers that are harvesting the tea, but also the distribution channels, mm. all the way down to the consumer. And as we said earlier, uh, tea is oftentimes a community event. Uh, people drink tea together. Mm -hmm. And during COVID, nobody was supposed to be together with other people other than their own family. Yeah. So how has that impacted uh, the market? Well, that's a great question. Um, believe it or not, the pandemic has not hurt the, the tea market per se, but had it certainly affected some of the supply chains. Um, due to its density and its weight, most tea is now shipped on pallets over the ocean. Um, so yes, there's definitely been disruptions to tea shipments. But that said, COVID-19 has not hurt our business, period. More people are drinking tea than ever before, and I'm saying that in general, uh, but also specifically, people are more focused on their lifestyle and are focused on what they're ingesting mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. their bodies. So some of these folks are choosing to kind of up their tea game right. and are now buying loose leaf teas. You know, they're buying better teas right. because of COVID. Um, the pandemic has certainly forced us to focus more on our online tea program. And so online sales have certainly um, gone up. But um, I think that, you know, that um, that ability to reach people uh, about really what makes tea, like you said, that that kind of social and communal piece. You know, we were forced to close our tea bar, not our shop, but sure. our tea bar. Sure. So all those people that used to come in with a friend or right. with their family, sit right. down, drink tea, and, and just kind of hang out in our shop. That didn't uh, work. You know, we don't do Wi-Fi, so, right. you know, we right. want to talk with you or, right. you know, want you to talk with your, right. you know, with your friends and, and your family. But um, we lost those cups of tea. Right. You know, we lost the cups of tea. But we more than made up for it in terms of, as I said, our online sales, you know, um, bolstering our wholesale program and really trying to strengthen some of those relationships you know, and I'm sure closely with them. Right. And I'm sure what you saw is probably a uh, happening on a larger scale. Absolutely. I mean, it's not, yeah, it, this was not just for us. This was not Missoula specific, yeah, yeah, but it's no, this was this for uh, other tea companies of our um, size and scale. Right. I think they experienced the, the same thing. Now we certainly at Lake Missoula tea company though, are very appreciative of our community. Sure. Because we live in a very good community that has been supportive of lots of local businesses. Sure. So we're thankful for that. But we're also appreciative, like other local businesses, for all the financial support we receive from the federal and state government. And, you know, without that, you know, we're, you know, that's the service industry side of it. Right. You know, where so much support right. was needed. Um, but, you know, if your customers know that you have good products, they're going to stay loyal. Right. You know, and so right. we've we've really been able to experience that. Sure. So that's a very good feeling for us. Right. To know that we have people that aren't going away. Right. It's, but again, it's sobering, too, that the you had to experience that under the, the circumstances of the pandemic. But but I, I do think that you're right. Uh, if there, uh, you know, and it's it's tough to to sort of call a silver lining in a pandemic. But 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 probably. What happened is that people, by having been isolated at home and by by not having been able to go out and to uh, socialize with other people, that may be, you know, in a restaurant or in a bar or yeah. wherever, um, probably people have sort of thought about changes they could make. And, and how their life might not be ideal uh, and it might not be the best way they can live. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was interesting. I talked to my grocer and uh, he said that uh, he saw, because people were not going out and spending money on, on, on food in restaurants anymore, yeah. so people had actually um, perhaps a small surplus of money that they then said, okay, so we can't go out to eat. Well, let's just sort of upgrade in what we eat. Let's let's buy, uh, you know, the fish or let's buy 
the cheese or whatever that we normally wouldn't buy because it's it's a you know it's a little more expensive but we don't do anything else so let's let's just splurge a little bit and let's get uh sort of an an upgrade in I think that's right. I think that more and more people are cooking, right? You know, on their own, right? And experimenting, right? With what they're cooking. So that's uh, probably all in all a, a good thing. And and then with tea, that, definitely. I mean, tea has helped. I think make us a little more introspective. Yeah. About yeah. things, and you know, again, thinking about, you know, maybe more than just kind of your own little sphere. You know, right, and, and, right. And, and like thinking about, you know, the bigger picture out there. A global uh, perspective. A global perspective. And, and so, yes, the, there is some silver lining out there. And people would say that to me, you know, about COVID, even though all these people are dying, all these people are, uh, uh, are being sick and, right. and, and hospitalized. Right. And, and uh, all this disruption, you know, to the fabric of our society. But the other side of it is. I'm not sure people were thinking all the way through, right. again, from a systemic right. standpoint. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Then that makes a lot of sense that that, that would also then uh, be impacting choices that people would make. Consumer choices. Uh, consumer choices yep. uh, in uh, lower grade tea to probably a little bit of a higher grade tea to say, I'm going to treat myself to uh, a better cup of tea or... Uh, yeah, so let that, me just you know. let me just do a little uh, little salesmanship here. That if you haven't drank the Rift Valley Current, so this comes from our Kenyan purple and black tea from David. It also has the black currant, some elderflower, and then of course the butterfly pea flower, um, which is the legume that also turns blue. Mm -hmm. um, you should because it is one of our best teas. Really layered. Um, but I'm drinking some of it cold right now, and I just love it. It's not too sweet, but again, it kind of attacks your taste buds a little bit. Right. Um, so yeah, come by the shop and get some of that Rift Valley Current and help David's family, um, you know, kind of move through this tragedy. And um, but you know, back to the whole COVID thing, we've emerged stronger from it. You know, and, and again, again, that's that's all you can say is that, you know, adversity should make you stronger. Right, right. Now, there are some other issues mm -hmm. uh, that um, aside from the pandemic, although that, of course, has has uh, been the focus. But um, how do the farms you work with deal with fair wages and social impacts? Yeah, it, it certainly varies from farm to farm and from company to company. But, you know, overall, what we have seen, you know, based on our trips and, and, uh, and on our observations while we're there, is that each of the farms that we work with kind of have their own kind of built-in system. And it's almost like they've replaced the government, if you will, in terms of the social safety net. And, you know, I know, you know, I described our, our, our farm Herendong in, in Indonesia and the two villages that it supports. And, uh, you know, they supply eyeglasses, you know, to mm -hmm. any of the workers in their families. Right. Um, you know, dental, um, dental work. You right. Know, things that aren't usually accessible, you know, in this sense, because this is rural. You know, this is really rural. Right. And, and most of these folks don't get to travel to places like Jakarta you know, or, um, or Bogar, you know, or some of the larger cities. So it's the company that really fulfills that function. Um, you know, I think in terms of the wage issues, um, there have been some pretty good investigative um, exposés about some of the problems in the Indian tea industry where we do have really large estates and, you know, it's not just low wages, but it's kind of poor living conditions and, you know, a lot of other associated social problems. Um, but I know that um, all of the companies that we work with really do care about their workforce. Um, the largest company who we work with is Nuxalbari Tea, um, and it's located in the Darjeeling district. And as far as we know, it's the only woman-owned tea estate in India. Um, Sonia Jabbar um, is the owner, and it was her parents um, who eventually her mother passed away, and Sonia decided that she was going to take, take it on, take it over. Um, so she's had it since 2011, um, and her company is large enough. I mean, she employs about 1,200 people, so way larger than the other farms that we work with by far. Um, 
that the Indian government really dictates the minimum wages um, and also what each employee gets as far as social benefits. So that is set by the government. She can definitely pay more sure. if she wants to. Sure. Uh, but again, there, there's kind of a, like I said, there's a threshold right. um, that she has to meet. Now, what's most cool is that she hires and promotes men and women equally. Uh, providing more opportunities for Excellent. women to advance in leadership Excellent. and other positions of power. Sure. And so we saw that firsthand, um, which was really cool. And her being a woman herself, I could just see the way that some of the men looked at her and the respect that they had for her. Of course. Which is amazing in India, which is a very patriarchal society. Right. Um, so, you know, again, I was – you know, just awestruck by some of the, the things that Sonia was doing. Now, Bataco Tea in Colombia, um, here's a good example. They've set up after-school activities and educational en enrichment programs on the weekends. Um, they also have a scholarship program for students who can pursue higher education, um, and they provide all the health care services. Um, so they're another really good example. Um, yeah, rural areas in some of these um, – in some of these countries um, in Asia and South America and Africa, again, you just don't have the social programs that we have in this country. And so, again, it has to come from the, um, the companies themselves. That's right. the only way to keep it going. Um, and then one other example that I'll just say is that David um, would always pay his pickers directly, mm -hmm. meaning the day of, mm -hmm. um, whereas the bigger companies – you don't get your money until that tea goes to market. Right. So they might be waiting a couple of months to right. get paid. Right. Um, so another good example of, again, we're going to pay you. And again, so the relationship is strong. And um, so, again, I felt like that was a really good, you know, kind of um, and I think it, example. Right. It must, it must have something to do with the level that you connect with. For a small tea farmer, the workers are – probably an extension of his or her family. And so you want health care for your extended family. You yep. want people to be able to go if they have a, a, a vision issue or if they have mm -hmm. uh, a dental issue to go and, and get help. Yep. Where perhaps a larger, more, um, how should we say, or, or a larger, less... Uh, connected mm -hmm. uh, structure might just not sort of say, hey, that's not our problem. You know, well, you're on your own with that. And, and I can uh, guarantee you this, like the tea pickers, who are mostly women, usually women. Right. Know, I don't want to generalize, but sure. you know, usually sure. women. You know, they're paid by the kilo. Right. You know, the, the amount. So it's a commodity. Right. But they know that they're going to get a much higher price for these loose leaf premium teas than they are for those teas that are going down to the broking the brokerage houses right. and get sold on the mass market, sure. you know, sure. and obviously probably made into the cheap breakfast teas. Right, right. Um, so they know that that matters in right. terms of the money trickling back down. Right. You know, I mean, not to they're say getting a better right. they're getting a better price. Right. I mean, not to say that 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 large companies don't don't do that and don't care about some do. No, so I'm, I'm sure yes. that there are uh, there are a lot that 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 do care. But it just seems more natural for a small farmer that that has a small group of people working for them to really see them as an extension of their family almost and to have a different connection to them than if you are part of a large structure where you are not considered, you know, an immediate family member kind of thing that yeah. I think that. And even like even at Sonia's place where, you know, again, the people kind of live right around the farm right you know they're all on the edge but right. i can remember they did a little show for us and all of the workers kind of came out of the woodwork and like they put some dances on for right. us and there was sure. a couple of songs sure but they just like i said it was like all of a sudden there were all these people around right. but again you could see it was that it was more than just a workplace there was, was a connection of a social it was kind of a social institution right there. right um, and again sonia's done a lot to foster that um, and, you know, when we get into some of the environmental um, aspects, I'll talk a little bit more about what Sonia's created. And, and, and that's a perfect segue, Jake, to my next question. Um, you are a passionate environmental activist. Um, tell me and the listeners, why is eco-activism important now more than ever? 
Well, Udo, as I like to say, no jobs on a dead planet. (laughs) (laughs) You know, all of us in our own way must confront, you know, the massive changes um, that we've wrought, you know, to the planet and, you know, our ever-growing footprint, you know, of our species. Um, I think it goes without saying, though, that our kids recognize these environmental problems way, way more than the grown-ups in the world. You know, so I always look to the youth um, for some inspiration. Sure. Um, and I do believe that they are starting to carry that torch and lead the fight to protect and restore, you know, not just the wildest places. And, you know, we know right. here in Montana, we've got some really important ones here and, um, you know, are fighting for, you know, species like the grizzly and, you know, in India for the elephant, right. and for the tiger and, sure. you know, for, for things that really are iconic. Right. Uh, but... It's also about doing the little things and growing our own food and cleaning up all these messes that we've made out on the land and in the water and, you know, up in the atmosphere. And, you know, like I said, it's not like environmentalists are going to go out of work anytime soon. (laughs) You know, there's plenty of work to be done. Um, But I think the reality is in order for some of this to happen, we're going to have to force major changes um, to our political system, which seems incapable of doing anything really right um, for the environment. Um, So that piece is a little bit more sobering, but again, on the positive side, um, you know, we have some good examples here with the elephant friendly tea certification program, um, which my friend and, you know, kind of fellow environmentalist, Lisa Mills started um, with her husband, Scott and the wildlife friendly enterprises network. And uh, the program was launched um, to educate tea farms and tea workers in ways to mitigate injury and death to wild Asian elephants. So the wild Asian elephant population has been plummeting for the last 50 years. Much of this is due to habitat loss. Right. And some of it is due to direct impacts, conflicts at the tea farms. So um, Lisa started this basically to promote environmental education in a lot of the local villages. Um, But it's also designed to really get the tea farms to remove things like the electrified fencing Mm -hmm. that kills elephants every year, Mm -hmm. um, to fill in the water trenches where young elephants will break their legs, Mm -hmm. um, to store, properly store the many herbicides and pesticides found on these larger tea estates. So these are practical things that the industry can be doing, Um, but again, that collaboration, that program right. is something, you know, that we obviously support. Now, Sonia, back to Sonia, you know, she was involved with this even before Lisa started the Elephant Friendly Certified Program because her estate, Nuxabari, is designated as an elephant corridor. Uh-huh. Elephants are using it and have been using it, and they come back. Right. They keep coming back because they know that they're safe. Now, part of what she's done is also institute – an education program for children. They call it Hathi Sathi. Um, So we've got a little tea, you know, one of our black teas is called this. But again, it's designed to teach the kids how they can coexist and live peacefully with the elephants and the other wildlife on the the estate. Um, So that's a great example of, again, doing it more in-house and making sure that her workers and their families understand how important it is for the elephants to be able to have that space. Um, she's also instituted a reforestation program, like I talked about at Pitaco. Mm-hmm. And so we were out there planting trees up on this hillside next to the creek, the catchment. And these were all elephant uh, trees that elephants can f- browse on um, and can eat. Right. So as these things grow, the elephants are going to be able to use them. Sure. So the other thing Sonia, of course, has been in the process of doing is transitioning her entire estate, her, her tea farm, to organic. Hmm. So this is a gradual process sure. because of what I stated. You know, it takes a while for the tea right. plants to be able to build up that resistance. Right. Um, but she's committed to it. Um, and so, again, there's a lot of positive stuff happening on the local level. Um, so we shouldn't lose sight of that, um, you know, in terms of the environment. But um, on a national and global scale, it can be very, very scary. And I, I think that, um, you know, that's why um, – Best to concentrate your energies closer to home, you know, and and get involved with either a local organization, a local project, a local issue, something that you can really sink your teeth into and organize with your peers. Well, and I really think that what you do locally does have an impact globally. It's just a lot of local people need to do it. 
and then and then you will see a change in a larger scale. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I I totally agree with you that that uh, it's better than doing nothing, uh, even if it's if it seems small. But if enough people do small things, they can make a big difference. They can so. make a big impact. Right. And, and, right. and certainly we have found that with the tea farms and sure. the tea companies that we work with is that there is a seriousness about this. And I also think that there's a, um, a realization that they want to leave – their children in a better place. Right. Um, and I'll just close on this note with uh, the quote from my friend Tenzing. So Tenzing is the Bodo man who um, he's got a farm next to his village in Udagri, but he also purchased with a friend, Jody, a little tea place right on the border with Bhutan. Mm-hmm. So like this is as wild, you know, you start up and it starts the Himalayas, you know, you're starting to walk up. Um, but he built this really cool little tree house in what he calls the Adam and Eve tree. Um, it has these little apples, which, uh, but this massive tree house that Heather and I stayed in. And that night we heard the elephants. We didn't get to see them, but we heard them. And just that elephant trumpet and that it's primordial. Um, but then right after we heard them, we heard the sound of the firecrackers going off. And that's of course the villagers trying to scare them away right so there's this constant push and pull you know where we've got to live with them but they can be dangerous and you know most people don't recognize in this country that elephants kill like 500 people in india every year a lot of people i mean if grizzlies killed that many i doubt we'd have many grizzly bears left right you know that's how like our culture very different than the East Eastern religions where i think they're more accepting you know whether you're talking about buddhism or Taoism, you know, some of these religions that Eastern religions that, again, are more accepting, right? You know, of right. things that can hurt you or kill you. Um, but my point, my point being is that right. I really, really think that um, we and myself, you know, we being the company and, and my wife and our family, we've gained a lot of knowledge, but also a lot of inspiration from these farms and from these, you know, from these farmers and and so, you know, it's like I said, it's been a good kind of uh, way to balance, you know, some of the things that are happening in our country right now. Um, you know, just to give me a little bit more hope and a little more inspiration and, going and you, forward. You certainly have given me and the listeners a lot of information about uh, about tea and tea growing and the environment. And uh, and and a lot of what you said, I think, is. Uh, is inspirational. You you think about it and you go, hmm, hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Uh, and I had those moments certainly throughout uh, where I went, huh, didn't know that. Uh, so that that was informative. <laughs> um, may I close, Jake, with uh, asking you where can our listeners find more information about our topic today? Are there some websites you can recommend for additional for additional information. You bet. Certainly check our website out at lakemissoulatea.com. We have many blogs. Um, We have um, a lot of different videos. Um, You know, there's a lot of info, again, about our trips, you know, some of the trips we've taken. If you dig deep into the website, you'll find some of that stuff. And of course, you know, we're on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and TikTok and all the other social apps. And, Great. You know, we're constantly posting on that stuff now because of, you know, people's uh, reliance on sure. their phones. Sure. You know, to, to basically do business. Right. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's where I would direct them. Um, certainly um, feel free to come by the shop and we'd love to have a conversation with you about, you know, why drinking tea will allow you to live longer. Um you know, it's, the thought. it's, it's, it's basically, it's magic water folks. You right. Know, that, that's all I can tell you is that all you got to do is, you know, heat up the water and add it to the, uh, the leaf and you instantly start feeling better. Thank you, Jake Krylik for your time and for talking to me today, for sharing your passion for tea and the environment. Tea in the 21st century, environmental sustainability and social responsibility was the title of our August podcast. This was the first part of a three-part series focusing on cultures and the environment. To the listeners near and far, 
please join me again next month for a new episode of International Voices. As always, thank you for listening. Those of you who are regularly tuning in to International Voices know, being of German descent, I usually end with a German farewell. Danke schön fürs Zuhören. International Voices is brought to you by Global and Cultural Affairs of Arts Missoula and The Trail 1033. This and previous International Voices podcasts can be found at artsmissoula.org and The Trail 1033.com. If your interests are in global and intercultural education, programming, cultural and global competence, and international affairs, we hope you continue to listen to International Voices. <laughs>